Maintaining national security means influencing the decisions and approach of malign actors to discourage or restrain them from taking harmful actions. As Western countries grapple with the prospect of facing increasingly ambiguous threats that are often hard to detect, deterrence is back in the spotlight. From hack and leak operations to the use of chemical weapons, what once was considered to be black and white has given way to multiple shades of grey. What kind of deterrence do we need for the next 50 years? What is the place of future hybrid challenges, cyber confrontation, information space challenges and technologies in a new type of deterrence? Is there space and vision for new understandings and approaches to deterrence? Ladies and gentlemen, please allow me to start off by saying two simple things, two simple truths. First of all, it's been five years since NATO uh, recognized cyber, cyberspace as a domain of operations. Secondly, uh, deterrence is a core concept uh, for NATO and um, for NATO strategy overall. However, when we take these two together and combine them, it becomes interesting and so many questions emerge. And that is why it is my great pleasure today to welcome you to the panel that is going to deal with exactly just that, uh, deterrence of the 21st century, new challenges versus old thinking. And our keynote speaker today uh, is His Excellency, Mr. Gabrielus Landsbergis, the Minister of Foreign Affairs of the Republic of Lithuania, our neighbors right there in the down south. Uh, Your Excellency, the floor is yours. So much, uh, ladies and gentlemen. A uh, big thank you to the organizers of, uh, of the conference for this kind invitation. Uh, over the years, the Riga Stratcom dialogue has become a signature event that generates and shapes ideas on how democratic states can deal with a growing threat of disinformation. I think, therefore, I deter American political scientist Richard Ned Lebo paraphrased that famous saying of Descartes, giving a crucial importance to the process of deterrence believing that deterrence is a significant element of security strategy. Although traditionally deterrence refers to conventional or nuclear means, we must also address evolving challenges such as complex cyber attacks and disinformation, especially knowing that modern threats recognize no borders. Thus, the response must also be agile, resolute, comprehensive, and international. Our discussion today takes place during the geopolitical situation in which there is a number of emerging malign state and non-state actors. However, in our region, we are most focused keeping an eye on our neighborhood. Every day, Russia is becoming more aggressive. The escalation of Kremlin's aggressive actions creates uncertainty that poses danger to the region and the international community. Russia has built up larger forces and uses military escalation overtly. The Kremlin has also demonstrated its resolve to initiate, and we shall not be afraid of this word, terrorist operations on NATO soil. Leaving its fingerprints on a military-style sabotage attack on a Czech weapons warehouse in 2014. Military threats emanating from Russia remain high and require our full attention, but its malign influencing campaigns aimed to destabilize the West are no less dangerous. We have been witnessing an extensive disinformation campaign fully supported and financed by the Kremlin. What we need now is an overreaching strategy and forward-looking policy for countering disinformation and foreign interference in the information space. So strategy and policy requires a wide approach that, that also encompasses a credible deterrence. Lithuania's case shows that deterrence does work in the information domain. Disinformation attacks against Lithuania seldom achieve their goals and fail to reach their initial targets. How did we achieve that? Firstly, we developed an early warning system which allows to detect information attacks at the early stages. Well-functioning, inter-institutional -inter cooperation and cooperation with the mainstream media also play an important part. Secondly, resilience building initiatives aim to strengthen our society, including various civic initiatives to fight disinformation have always been the key factor of our deterrent strategy. Thirdly, 
Lithuania tailored its administrative structures and modified national legislation to, to the ever-changing nature of disinformation threats. For example, the Independent Radio and Television Commission of Lithuania several times have provisionally suspended retransmission of pro-Kremlin TV programs that violated national law on incitement of war, war and violence. One of the first suspensions happened back in 2015, after which the European Commission concluded that the decision was adequate and consistent with the Union's law. So how can we build on Lithuania's lessons learned as we debate a forward-looking deterrent strategy? First, we have to admit that it's impossible to prevent disinformation attacks completely. But we can increase resilience and prevent possible damage. We can raise costs for spreading disinformation and we can expose those responsible. All this, no doubt, influences the calculus of disinformation actors. The important enabler of deterrence, first of all, is political determination to act. We need to build on constantly and constantly enhance our retaliatory capabilities. We need to build strong partnerships with the private sector and civil society at home. We need to engage educational institutions and increase media literacy. Strong resilience must demonstrate our preparedness to withstand an attack, to take all necessary steps to mitigate risks and to adapt our response to the nature of an attack. Here, we must also mention that there is no panacea for one size fits all approach when it comes to deterrence. The response must be actor specific and multi-domain, be it legal, political, or economic. What makes the use of disinformation so attractive to some actors is that disinformation so far has been a low risk, low cost, and potentially high reward activity. So naturally, raising costs, making the adversary to rec reconsider cost-benefit calculations, including the use of sanctions, is another crucial instrument. We very much welcome the proposed European Democracy Action Plan, which aims to counter foreign disinformation and discusses the possible use of sanctions. We should also explore ways for using other relevant existing frameworks to introduce sanctions such as cyber toolbox or human rights violation mechanism. We already have a precedent. Dmitry Kiselyov, who heads Russia Today Group, is under EU sanctions for his role in promoting Russia's annexation of Crimea in 2014. Another important deterrence element is denial of capabilities. Again, one of the examples is Russia Today. Russia Today registers in the EU, it invokes our rights and freedoms, but then it misuses the same rights against our societies by spreading disinformation that aims to divide our societies and poses serious security threats. It is time to reach a common understanding on how to deal with actors that call themselves journalists or media, while in actuality, they are neither. Their finances and their editorial policy are controlled by the government, and then, then they are used as an information weapon. There are cases when disinformation actors are their influence networks or proxies. We have to invest in our analytical capabilities so that we would be able to detect that and better understand how the networks are working. Imposing costs on proxies instead of patrons might also be a more acceptable alternative to some. A hostile actor that engages in information, disinformation, or any hybrid attack very often wants to remain unattributed. Therefore, exposure and political attribution are key elements of deterrence strategy. The latest round of US sanctions on Kremlin was accompanied by quite a large amount of details. The US published information about Russian intelligence activities, named organizations and individuals, including the so-called IT or media companies and organizations. Such exposure sends a signal and makes it harder for Russia to operate and deters future activities. Theoretically, incentives form an important part of comprehensive international policy. However, based on the regional experience, our hypothesis is that in the, in the case of Kremlin's information wars, the incentives offered by the West may be understood by Moscow as a sign of weakness, or even worse, as appeasement. Kremlin's dis disinformation attacks against Ukraine, United States, UK, Lithuania, or recently again the Czech Republic, and in general against Western democracies is a painful reminder that hybrid threats do not recognize national borders. 
The response needs to be international. Allies and like-minded countries must come together. Our partnerships and the demonstration of our solidarity, capability and resolve are critical part of a successful deterrence. All that said, one must recognize that although traditional military deterrence concepts remain the foundation in the current geopolitical situation, we should constantly use the elements of deterrence in light of the changing nature of warfare and evolving threats. Modern conflicts require modern solutions, and deterring adversary against it should reflect the situation. A calibrated, multi-level response is key. Thank you. Thank you, Your Excellency, for a very comprehensive uh, keynote speech that really sets, sets the agenda for our conversation later today. Now, you have pointed out that Lithuania is uh, quite a strong believer in this enhanced uh, concept of new wider deterrence, if, if I read it correctly. So, and you also mentioned that strong partnerships are key, but you spoke about strong partnerships at home. Now, what about strong partnerships wider? And of course, you did mention the EU, but I'm trying to hear what do you have to say regarding the future of NATO? Uh, so, how do you see NATO should tackle this issue of deterrence in this current new decade? Thank you for the question. I think that, uh, first of all, uh, any organization is a network. And uh, through network, we can uh, not only build trust between the partners, but also share uh, the information that we have. And uh, it's very useful. And, and today, what we're using this opportunity to share Lithuania's experience to, uh, to those who are interested. But well, we can do that in, uh, in the partnerships like NATO or EU, as well as uh, with, uh, with the countries that are seeking to get, uh, to get closer uh, to uh, NATO or EU, be it uh, associated members, associated partners in the Eastern Partnership or Eastern Partnership as a whole. That means that the lessons learned in Lithuania can be used in, in other NATO countries. The lessons that are learned in Lithuania could be used in other Eastern Partnership countries that they would deter uh, similar attacks by Russia or any other state or non-state actors more effectively. And uh, in case of Lithuania, this is what we're doing. And just a couple of weeks ago, we've experienced certain, what we could call an information attack uh, that was uh, that targeted uh, some of the uh, Mm, opposition members uh, from Russia that are uh, staying in Lithuania, the, the Lithuanian politicians were targeted as well, as well as uh, politicians from Latvia, Estonia and some other EU countries. But then later on, we've shared the information with uh, our, our friends and partners in Ukraine, and uh, hopefully we help them better prepare for, for similar attacks if they would happen. And this, since you've dived into the Lithuanian um, experience here, I would like to um, kind of pull that thread a little further and ask you, you know, to pull this together with the topic of strategic communications. Obviously, when a country uh, or an entity is faced with, with, with an attack of this kind, a strategic communication is key. And I believe Lithuania has, has had a very good track record in this, um, um, in this domain. So could you maybe please illustrate uh, how do you see that? What are the best practices and what are the challenges right now at communicating fairly, clearly, and as a united organism indeed when faced with these uh, attacks? New challenges, thank you. Uh, I think it's, it's, it's a rather difficult uh, question to answer. And I think it was, uh, uh, it was used uh, by malign actors uh, that a country is, uh, was and used to be, countries were used to be rather slow to react when a disinformation campaign started. Um, you know, a country has to go through a several uh, levels of checks and balances in order to counter a, a lie that is being spread, uh, let's say in the election time or something like that. But uh, in Lithuania, the, the best example was that a, uh, a civil society joined in uh, as a uh, independent movement uh, in order to um, establish when the disinformation campaign uh, has started and to counter it. 
And at the beginning, with a very little help from the state, from the country, from the government, uh, civil society has achieved a lot and now is used as a, as a great example of where the people who are concerned about, the, well, let's say, hygiene of the um, uh, public space or of, uh, of informational space, when they try to react. Now we're seeing that, uh, for example, several uh, social networks are using a similar thing when they are asking for civil society members to evaluate whether the information is, is uh, truthful or not and kind of to, um, to prepare the readers that a certain bit of information was deemed by civil society members as, uh, uh, as, as, fraud, as fraudulent, let's say. So the example from, from the thing that started, I would say, since 2014, uh, is now used in, in several countries, but still remains of the more effective instruments against the disinformation campaigns. Nice, thank you. And we have a very engaged audience here today and yesterday. So a very relevant question from one of our audience members. Uh, how can we measure the efficiency of our deterrence uh, towards a potential adversary in order not to cross the threshold of escalation. So how much of a response is enough but just enough? Well, deterrence is, is, uh, shouldn't, should never be an uh, escalation, especially in the information um, sphere, I would say. I mean, the, the most you can... Uh, you can measure the effectiveness of deterrence by new uh, disinformation attacks that are uh, effective disinformation attacks that are reaching your country. And in, in Lithuania's case, as I mentioned in, in my uh, initial speech, is that not so many attacks are effective. Not so many attacks actually reach their target. And um, I would say that we are not experiencing something of a rise. And uh, this is quite a different experience that we, mm, from our perspective, that we see in several other Western countries, uh, which are yet, some of them are yet to uh, accept the fact that, that they actually are under attack by a malign actor. That means that the attacks are reaching them easier and they are, therefore, they are more effective. That means that the deterrence is not working. Thank you. And this brings me also to, to the next question. As you're sharing your experiences, uh, clearly this is something you do every day with your partners, both within the EU, within NATO, and also regionally right here um, at the shores of the Baltic Sea. So my question is to push you a little bit, is to say, do you feel like the Baltic states are as united as they used to be when they uh, reinstated their independence after the, fall, after the collapse of the Soviet Union? Uh, or do you feel that there are different approaches to these new challenges in the security domain that we are all facing? Well, you know, I would say that strategically we're, uh, we haven't been more united than we are now. Uh, truly, I can say that uh, from Lithuania standpoint, we see our strategic uh, issues absolutely the same way as, as in, in, in Latvia and Estonia. Um, Tactically, we might differ. We might choose different paths because, well, it's, uh, it has to do to the democratic nature of our countries. You know, um, new governments form, new politicians um, come to, to take positions, and this is quite, quite normal, I would say. But then again, you know, we, we can work on a tactical level as well uh, to align our responses to a certain um, uh, threats or risks that arise or have a certain uh mutual initiatives and uh i think what we are at this point we're able to achieve a lot when we work together and i'm quite happy with the level also on the tactical level where, where we are with the within our baltic trio you spoke of a of, of one particular state actor and that came up in your in your um keynote um quite a bit that was russia but now the Baltic region is faced with more and more presence of another state actor that is also kind of pushing the limits of new deterrence, and that is China. Uh, what is your comment on on this, um, the on a regional approach towards the challenges and opportunities, as as NATO uh, puts it, uh, that China brings to our shores? 
Well, I think that, you know, um, somehow uh, the discussion about China's influence in, um, in the Baltic region was, was late to arrive. And uh, I think that the debate about, you know, how should we um, see China, you know, because there are several tracks. We can see it as an economic partner, as a challenger, as an opponent, you know, when we're talking about the human rights, let's say. Um, and we've just uh, began uh, our, our discussion. I think that the first step is, uh, is rather critical. We have to acknowledge that um, the, the story about the ec economic China was not completely true. And it was true. We were being convinced that uh, anything we do with China is pure, uh, pure business. I mean, it's, there's nothing else behind it. You know, we just it's just trade. You know, for uh, mutually beneficial trade. I think we need to accept the fact that there is no uh, with China. There is no economy without politics, and with politics come influence. And then we have to agree or at least start to um, discuss how much of the political influence uh, in this economic disguise we're welcoming and how, do, how we are dealing with it, you know, how do we approach it? Because when one, one of the discussion partners is denying that it's all, it also asserts political influence, it's kind of a difficult discussion, isn't it? So uh, I think that, um, um, so for one, I mean, it's uh, the discussion started about this this format that is uh, um, that all of the three Baltic countries are in were at least uh, until recently engaged in. It's seventeen plus one, uh, and uh, and Lithuania quite uh, quite recently took a decision no longer to participate in in this format because we feel that it's uh, impossible to, as I mentioned, to uh, devise which part is pure econ economics and then which part is politics. So kind of we want a more uh, transparent, more clear uh, relationship with, um, with China. Perfect. And I was going to say thank you here, but we have a hardball question from the audience and I hope you don't hold it against me if I ask it. Uh, so deterrence is demonstrated uh, you know, in the kinetic domain, obviously, deterrence is demonstrated in, um, uh, via exercises, and it is observable by all, by all of the audiences, so it's clear and out there. Now, how would you see the cyber stratcom capabilities being exercised in order to deter? Well, you know, we have to, we have to distinguish between the cyber and uh, disinformation, at least from where I stand. Uh, but certain rules apply to both of them. Uh, first of all, is um, attribution. Uh, you know, whenever we're talking about the cyber threats, uh, the, the actors that, um, uh, that are involved in this and uh, uh, make these attacks happen, they usually think that they are disguised enough in order to the attack not to be attributed to them. There are so many ways to disguise yourself, you know, kind of, uh, the country can be seen as a teenager in, uh, you know, in the basement in North Korea, and, uh, and kind of how do you attribute who's who's behind the attack? But that did change, and the countries and uh, the alliance itself now has the capability and political will to attribute. And um, uh, I think one of the more interesting, but from the political science sphere, I would say, cases was the solar attack, uh, solar wind attack that happened last year, uh, the global attack. And um, it was very interesting to see how uh, the new administration in the US is, is handling the whole, um, approaching the whole thing. And they attributed it, you know, very, very easily. They put a cost on it in, uh, with a heavy sanctions, which was, again, the whole sanction concept was very new uh, in this, in this domain. So I think that the countries are able to, uh, with these examples are able to send a very clear message that if you're trying, if you're going to attack our country in a cyber domain, these are the toolkits and this is the tool set that we are going to use against you. We will attribute, we will sanction. So that means that we'll raise costs for your next attack. 
Thank you very much, Your Excellency, for your excellent keynote and for your frank and very ambitious replies, which sets a great framework for our conversation uh, further on. And uh, we, hope oh, yes. you, uh, we hope to speak to you uh, again within this format. So, uh, within the following format, so I, I, I was meaning to say, pardon me. So now, uh, we have just to uh, clarify these concepts that have come um, uh, come up today, we have, um, and to explain them further, we have three excellent experts. And I would like to start by welcoming uh, Miss uh, Rebecca Heinrichs, who is the senior fellow at Hudson Institute. You have probably seen her on one of the numerous news outlets that she is uh, a commentator on, both in the US and also on our side um, of the ocean. She specializes in nuclear deterrence and missile defense, arms control, nonproliferation, teaches nuclear deterrence theory. Now, Rebecca, let's start off by clarifying this concept of deterrence. What's its history? How has it even emerged? And what things look like from Arlington? Thank you so much for that kind introduction. It is a pleasure to be here with all of you. Um, and uh, I, I look forward to the discussion and to learning from my colleagues and from their remarks as well. So what I wanted to do is I wanted to set the stage for, for, the, for the discussion today. Um, and we're talking about deterrence, but I think it's useful to flesh that out. What, what is deterrence? It, it is the, um, the act of convincing our adversary to not take a particular action against one of our vital interests. And, and so really what we're trying to do is we're trying to preserve the peace when we say that we're trying to deter. And deterrence was something that the United States um, discussed uh, quite a bit more during the Cold War. So this is a kind of a concept that really arised and was much more robust in how um, we thought about this when we were thinking about how do we deter the Soviet Union. And since the fall of the Soviet Union, we've we moved away from it as a popular or prominent conversation in the in think tank world or in in how uh, policymakers think about what the United States is doing in the world and how we're thinking about defense policy, and um, that has actually been the prevalent you know kind of case. But there's always been a few of us who have been plugging away, and my area of expertise over the last decade has really focused on Russia in particular. That Russia is still the, the primary adversary that the United States needs to think about deterring. And, and it's, it's, you deter an actor, you deter a regime, you don't deter action. So a lot of times when you hear people talk about deterrence, they say, we want to deter an attack on X, or we want to deter an invasion. You're really not deterring any of those things. You're deterring the actor from taking that particular action. And so different degrees of, of coercion or of threats might be required depending on each particular action that you might, that you seek to prevent from happening. Moreover, it's not just Russia that the United States is primarily concerned about um, anymore. It's now China and China more than Russia. And, and the reason for that is because, uh, and I appreciated the last conversation you had um, where you discussed China. The reason for that is, is two things because we have a variety of threats facing the United States and, and facing the free world. But the reason we, we are so worried about China and the United States now is two things, and that's its desire to, to threaten vital interests of the United States, to contest those, and its ability to carry out those threats. And, and it has that, it, but the combination of those two things is, a more potent, is more potent in the case of the Chinese Communist Party than it isn't even for the Russian Federation though both of them are very, very serious threats. And so the United States now seeks primarily to think about, that's our pacing threat. That's, that's who we're trying to deter. And it's who we're thinking about when we think of the rest of our defense policy. And it's how we talk about our allies and partners. And now NATO is talking about China very prominently in the EU context, it's thinking about and talking about China. 
And, and the United States is pushing this, not just the United States, it's our, it's our allies, the Australians, the Japanese, um, and uh, the, the, the Indians. These are, these are conversations that we're having there, um, but they don't stay there. You know, they spill over uh, to, into the European context as well. Um, and, and so that those are, I, I can go on and talk about the specific things that the Chinese and the Russians are doing that are concerning to us and that are driving this concern. But I'll just, I wanna to get to the rest of my colleagues' uh, comments as well, so then we can, um, I think, have a fruitful conversation. But the, but the, but the other thing that, that makes these two countries um, the most concerning for the United States, and that is their nuclear capabilities. And so when we think about deterrence too, you know, we, we, we will often now think about just conventional, we think about conventional threats, but really kind of the, the, the 400 pound um, gorilla in the room is that both of these countries are serious uh, nuclear powers. And um, if you've been watching the conversations in Congress, the very pu the public um, testimony of our, of our STRATCOM commander, he has been very publicly sounding the alarm as calmly as he can to American uh, to the American um, policymakers, but obviously all audiences are watching. So this goes for, this this is part of deterrence and, and strategic communications when you make these comments publicly. Um, that the that the threat of, of a nuclear exchange has actually gone up, and we probably are are we are we are at a time now um, that it's it's more of a serious concern. Um, than, than we were since the Cold War. We're, 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 this is where we've kind of, we've had this big uptick. Well, why is that? Why is that? It's because um, the way these countries are thinking about employment of nuclear weapons. And, and then I'll just leave this with in the, in the context. And you can see the direction. Again, you always think about the will of the country and the capability, the will to employ harm and their ability to carry out that harm. And in, in the case of the, the Russian context, we're very, very concerned that the Russians have invested so heavily in these low yield tactical nuclear weapons, making them more usable and thereby lowering the threshold of which nuclear employment might take place. And so when you talk about escalation and you're trying to um, use coercive diplomacy to get a country or to compel a country to stop doing their aggressive action, for instance, invading Ukraine, you're trying to get the Russians to get out of a country that they have erroneously believed is theirs because they have this erroneous belief that where there are Russian speakers, there's Russia, which is false. And it's a, it's a, complete, um, it's a complete disregard for the way the rest of us look at, look at the problem, which is that there are sovereign nations with borders, with distinct um, uh, borders of which all of us recognize and you do not violate them, these are sovereign nations. And so you can try to compel using coercive, coercive diplomacy to get that country to stop doing that action um, that they're taking um, to reestablish peace. And, and so what we're concerned about is that the Russians might misjudge NATO's will uh, to defend other NATO countries in a purely conventional non-nuclear context, thereby employing a smaller, a small yield nuclear weapon to escalate a situation in order to get the rest of us, NATO, to back out of that for fear of escalating a situation further. And, and we call that concept escalate to de-escalate. And so you can see that the threshold has lowered in the case of the Russian context. And so the United States has sought to, to, in, to, to raise that threshold to make nuclear employment much less likely. And I can give other scenarios that we're concerned about in the case of the China context as well. So deterrence is a very large concept, but, but, but really kind of undergirding all of it is the, is the belief that there is this, uh, this nuclear threat that exists. And so how do we stay in, in the uh, domain in which we do not get to the point where we have a strategic attack um, against a, an American vital interest, which we count as a vital interest, the security of the NATO alliance. Um, as well as the, our ability to carry out our security commitments that we've extended to our Asian allies in the Indo-Pacific theater, um, which means we, we would like to, we need to make good on our ability to extend credibly that nuclear umbrella to our Asian allies um, who are threatened by, uh, uh, by China. So I'm gonna leave it there so that we can turn over to my colleagues and I look forward to their remarks and also to the, the questions from the audience. 
be let you sit back and listen to the colleagues, I want to ask you um, a couple of questions. Uh, just now, um, when you, uh, the, it, first of all, it's, it's really uh, worrisome what you illustrated. We somehow have come to believe that children ducking under school desks um, during a, uh, um, a training to, um, is, is kind of a 20th century thing, that this nuclear issue is a little bit in the past now, and what you've pointed out is that it could still uh, be something in the future as well. Now, you have, we had a conversation once, and what you told, told us is that, um, and that goes into what uh, His Excellency was asked just now in his, during his keynote Q&A, is the telegraphing punishment issue. So, you, your, your opinion uh, that you expressed is that in these traditional domains, it's quite clear, right? Whereas in, the, in cyber and in these new uh, challenges, uh, deterrence is really murky because um, you cannot really signal punishment. Now, could you please explain? And I'm going to give the colleagues an uh, the opportunity to maybe disagree with you on that. Absolutely. Um, right. You, we, we want to be able to show again, deterrence is about convincing our adversary that whatever action they want to take, we will not, we will make sure that they will regret that particular action. Okay. And it's difficult to measure because we are, we are dealing with trying to um, have an absence of an action. That's what, that's what deterrence is about. And we have a variety of tools in our toolbox. And uh, cyber attack is certainly one of them. We, but, but because deterrence is all about trying to convey, trying to signal what, what these punishments can be. And you can have, deterrence works in two forms, deterrence by punishment. So you're retaliating against the other country for doing something that they should not have done, that your hope is to make them regret the particular action and not do it again. And you have deterrence by denial that is thwarting whatever action they would like to take that would be against an interest um, uh, of yours, the country that is that is the victim of an attack. In the case of cyber, it is harder because if there is a cyber attack, you you want and again the Western way of war, you know all all of us all of us um, carry out actions that match with the kind of country we, we are. So we want it to be proportional. We don't want it to escalate. We don't attack with intentionality. Civilians, we, we, would, we try to limit the amount of harm done to civilian populations while also trying to exact a punishment, a pain against the regime that carried out an attack. So all of these things have to be considered when we think about what is a pro proper retaliation. In the case of cyber, um, sometimes you know, it's harder, but you can point to particular uh, attacks that do occur and um, without that country overtly taking claim for doing that, you can demonstrate what that country has and then by inference, potentially what other countries have. So for instance, to, to, to clarify, the Iranian nuclear program was just attacked. It was just attacked through um, uh, uh, non-kinetic means that set back the Iranian nuclear program. Now, no, to my knowledge, there has not been any sort of official attribution, but we have some ideas about who, who, who which country may have done that. Um, what that does is it does have an, an effect on how other countries then think about what, what capabilities exist and what they're capable of doing. And, and so in that particular way, we're not going to telegraph who did it or what they had, but you can, you can deduce what kinds of capabilities these countries have who could carry out an offensive cyber attack that could do real damage to, to something like a nuclear program. In the case of what the Russians have done, where they've attacked uh, our economy using cyber weapons, really all the United States has done in response to that is, is carry out sanctions. Um, I, I, I have argued that that's not enough, that the damage that a cyber attack does is simply um, greater than potentially just sanctioning a couple of individuals in the Russian government um, who, who were guilty of that. So, so I think as we think about cyber attacks and the kinds of serious damage that cyber attacks can, can, can carry out, that we need to be more creative in thinking about. It hasn't worked. We haven't, so far the responses we've had to Russian cyber attacks have not had the effect of causing the Russians to think that a cyber attack has not been worth the political cost that it has been to them. 
Rebecca. And uh, now I would like to introduce our second panelist, uh, Mr. Łukasz Kulesa, who is the deputy head of research at the, uh, research at the Polish Institute of International Affairs. And his research interests are grounded in nuclear and conventional deterrence and arms control. So this is the right room uh, for Łukasz. Um, and also Russian security policy in NATO. Now, Łukasz, the moment uh, Rebecca said that the sanctions are just not enough, you picked up your pen. Do you have a response to that? Uh, well, that's that's because uh, in this particular case, the, the solar winds attack, uh, but also in the case of, of a number of other attacks, uh, we uh, don't necessarily know what is happening. Uh, and uh, there is a public sphere for that, which we have seen, which was naming and shaming, which was sanctions and a, a pretty detailed uh, description uh, of uh, what the United States uh, can actually share about what, it's, what it knows about the attack. Of course, they know a lot more about it, uh, but there might be things going on uh, in the intelligence area, in the covert operations idea area that we don't know about, and we might uh, know from indirect sources or looking at effects. And as Rebecca said, uh, nobody would telegraph uh, that a particular uh, U.S. action uh, create a particular effect inside uh, Russia. But if something like this is happening, then the people uh, who are watching this thing in Kremlin and in other places, they know about it. Uh, whether they would be deterred, uh, it's, it's another question, because I think the cyber domain is... Uh, an interesting area in which we are right now in the process of actually determining uh, the red lines and determining to what extent the deterrence logic uh, works uh, in particular uh, cases. So the jury is still out. We are learning by doing, or the countries that are engaged in this um, actions and some of the non-state actors, they are learning by doing. I would say that uh, so far, it seems that some deterrence logic uh, was established in the cyber domain. Uh, from what we have seen, uh, there were no successful attacks against crucial command and control uh, elements, especially certainly none of the, of the nuclear weapon states. Uh, nuclear forces uh, themselves, uh, critical, critical infrastructure in a very narrow sense, the infrastructure that is sustaining life uh, so we had no attacks that cause massive damages. Uh, and we may, of course, uh, discuss whether it happened because uh, there was a deterrence logic being applied and the other side was uh, constrained in their actions or some of the attacks uh, were uh, perhaps uh, stopped. But what we are seeing right now that there's a lot going on in the cyberspace that we unfortunately cannot deter. Uh, we can be more resilient about it. Uh, we can uh, uh, retribute at afterwards, but uh, there were some uh, uh, events in cyberspace that didn't happen. And again, you have a major problem of deterrence that Rebecca talked about because it's difficult to, um, to argue that something didn't happen because of the deterrence measures that we applied. If I may jump in too to what Lukas just, oh, it just Lukas, he, he, he Please made a go great ahead. point. He made a great point about um, one of the things we have to consider when something like that happens, the solar winds attack happens, is what did not happen. And so I thought that was a really great point that he made is that we did not see a, um, a kind of disruption uh, from a societal standpoint. A lot now, a lot, of, a lot of what did happen and a lot of the damage, and it was a massive cyber attack. So I don't wanna downplay how bad it was and how serious it was, but either one of two things happened, either the, either the attack very intentionally did not cripple um, life, had, you know, this is, this is civilian life, um, or, uh, or, it, or it stopped to, but we thwarted, thwarted it. We, we had the ability to, to prevent that. And we don't, we don't know that in the public realm. And, but that would be what I, that category of deterrence by denial. If the United States knows that the that the Russians, I'm, I'm going to attribute it because our intelligence community has attributed that it was almost certainly the Russians who did this. Um, deterrence by denial is the ability to, to thwart an intended attack 
And um, again, what we don't know, like Lukas made this point, we, we perhaps the US government is exacting a punishment against the Russian government that we don't know about publicly, but that they would understand what that cost was. Um, I, I still think if, if there was an intentional attack like that, um, that, that it should elicit such, such a response because it, was, it would be such a, desire, a, a dire attack against the United States that there would be something um, public enough to communicate to other actors that might be considering it that they too could be on the receiving end of a, a, retali a, a, a retaliatory action um, that would be severe. But, but it is a good point to consider that, that, that um, much of this, especially in cyber, part of it is because we don't, um, it, it is new, we are learning as we go, and, and, and we want to make sure that we are not in unintentionally escalating from a, from a non-kinetic field. Um, but I would just, just for the sake of discussion, say that you know, it is not off the table that, that kinetic responses would still be appropriate in, in response to a non-kinetic attack should that attack, you know, should we should we deem that necessary to um, to establish the kind of response required to to maintain credible deterrence? Talking a lot about how the things are seen in the U.S., but Wukaj, I'm sorry that I'm kind of chipping away at your presentation and at your 10 minutes of talking, but I just want to jump in right away with a question, and then you can take it whichever way you like. Your time has not been exhausted yet. So could you maybe give us more about more of a European perspective, or rather scratch that, you know, plural perspectives on, on this issue? Sure, and for a moment, I thought that my 10 minutes are already gone. Uh, so thanks, thanks for the reminder. Um, yes, it's, it's, it's uh, of course, a very rich field in the United States and uh, a number of strains in the deterrence uh, discussion. And if we talk about the uh, nuclear deterrence, um, no, it's uh, probably the United States that invented the, the field uh, in, the first, in the first place. Um, but no, there is something that can be identified as a U.S. tradition of, of deterrence and uh, certain characteristics uh, that you can trace them uh, back to the early stages of the Cold War. Uh, when it comes to, to Europe, uh, you know, indeed, uh, there is no one European strategic culture, so there is no one European approach to uh, deterrence. Of course, NATO acts as a great unifier and as uh, a great uh, source of the deterrence IQ um, in Europe. And uh, there is a uh, defense and deterrence uh, posture of the alliance, but no, not all European states are in NATO, but uh, even those who are in NATO, they maintain their own uh, traditions or their own approaches. Uh, it's certainly true with regards to uh, France and the UK, because there is also the, the nuclear aspect involved. Uh, but I would argue that every single uh, NATO member also has uh, their own uh, special approach to deterrence. And we've just heard uh, a Lithuanian uh, flavored uh, deterrence, uh, so to say. Another thing which I would add is, uh, uh, a certain unease in some European countries and among the European population about the nuclear aspect uh, of uh, deterrence, the idea that we are threatening uh, the adversary uh, with the consequences that are simply horrific, uh, that are extensive by default. Um, and this is one of the issue also for, for NATO as we try to uh, explain our deterrence posture, and this is part of the STRATCOM uh, is, is doing uh, to the populations that may have very legitimate questions, uh, is, is nuclear deterrence moral, is nuclear deterrence um, uh, legal? Um, so yeah, and within this, this European uh, perspective, uh, still, you know, the discussion of deterrence is there because the challenges to deterrence is there. And I would like to very much go back to what Rebecca said. Uh, that we often talk about deterrence as a, a kind of shortening the, the, the idea, but of course it's always deterring who, uh, deterring what, and deterring how. Uh, and you know, we, we always need to expect uh, the, 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 this question and also the response to the question. Um, when it comes to what's going on in, in, in the deterrence field, I would highlight three issues or three parallel processes. The first one is what Rebecca said. 
uh, which is that the traditional deterrence of between nuclear armed adversaries is back. Uh, Russia, China, uh, sorry, not Russia, China, Russia, US, China, US, uh, India, China, uh, India, Pakistan, you can make this diets and triads any way you, you want uh, with a twist. A twist is that uh, you have a number of systems which are non-nuclear, but may also have uh, some strategic consequences. Um, but no, some of the traditional discussions is back. Also some traditional discussions about uh, the credibility of deterrence, of extended deterrence. So the United States, for example, extending nuclear deterrence to its European or Asian allies. Uh, the second uh, issue, the second dimension uh, is broadening the logic of deterrence to the new fields. Uh, and new domains. We discussed a lot about uh, cyber, uh, but previously uh, the minister Landsberg is, uh, he discussed about the application in the gray zone or in a hybrid uh, domain when we have a number of challenges about uh, using these traditional notions of deterrence uh, where clarity is, 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 is very much important. And the third area, the third process uh, is the question of deterring uh, non-state actors. Uh, which was very popular a couple of years ago when it seemed like non-state actors were the main thing for, for our security. Uh, it went a little bit down in interest, but uh, the question did not disappear. Um, there's a very simplistic notion that you cannot deter a terrorist organization. Uh, it's not true. You can deter some types of organizations from some types of actions. Just ask the Israelis and they're dealing with Hezbollah and they're dealing with uh, Hamas. So you, you take these three strains, then you add the technological advantage, advances over it. And I don't think that they kind of radically trans, transform or negate the logic of deterrence, but they certainly have an impact uh, on the operationalization uh, of deterrence. Uh, and then you end up in a pretty complicated environment in which deterrence is not a static concept. This is, it's very dynamic. Uh, and if you ask me if you can apply deterrence to uh, cyber, if you can apply deterrence to gray zone, uh, I would say it depends. It depends and we need to talk more about it. And let me stop here for the, my 10 minutes. <clears throat> I will be happy to go into the details during the conversation, the details of the role of the STRATCOM, because I think this is, this is a very important uh, aspect of the, of the conversation. I will reserve that question for you. I just have the right question. But now we have had an extremely patient and very involved third panelist. And it is my honor to welcome Dr. Beza Unal, who's the Deputy Director of the International Security Department at Chatham House. And Dr. Unal has quite a few hats probably not up her sleeve, that doesn't make sense, but you know what I mean. And one of the hats is space and cyber nuclear. So, Dr. Unal, um, that I know that we've spoken before on this, and, and you have said that actually deterrence hasn't really worked on Russia. And I have a question uh, to start you off. You, you know, feel free to incorporate it in your presentation whenever you like, but basically the question is, the MH17 case was v well attributed to Russia by Bellingcat without visible effect on Russian behavior. Are we maybe too preoccupied with attribution? The floor is yours. <laughs> Well, Una, just a question. Did my right now? Am I starting my ten minutes to mark as well? So, so that link it up everything. Or Please. Would you like me to answer the question? Please. Okay. Whenever uh, you, you can touch upon the question, because I'm sure you will find a place to incorporate it into your overall overview. Yes. 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 There is. But I also I think just starting from your question on the attribution. I think attribution is just one of the measures that the Western societies and countries have. Um, in their toolbox, and it's not the only thing that that we rely on. It's it, it's becoming one of the main issues. Um, the question that is whether when you attribute to a country, whether that country actually deters from taking uh, further actions and not follow any more cyber attacks or not. And the answer to that, from when it comes to Russia, is a no, uh, because we have seen a lot of attacks from Russia uh, so far. Uh, cyber attacks, I mean, and there's disinformation, misinformation campaigns as well. And uh, there has been some attribution that's going on within the UK and United States on this, but uh, that attribution has not yet actually came fruitful in terms of deterring uh, Russia not to follow 
the, the further actions. So I would just probably put it in that. Um, but I would like to probably touch on what Rebecca was talking about, and as well as Lukash, in a way, stated on the nuclear side of the issues and bringing it back to the emerging tech questions uh, that that came out, uh, perhaps. Um, I think there are two issues that we need to we need to focus on when it comes to deterrence and, and specifically to nuclear deterrence. Um, the first is that there, there are a number of challenges that the nuclear deterrence actually faces in the 21st century. Um, and that's not much you know, talked about, uh, but, but it's, not, it's not the same as the Cold War period anymore. It's completely different. And that's why I think Lukash mentioned that this is a dynamic, we need to talk about dynamic deterrence. Um, and the second point is, okay, if, if there are so many challenges out there, what, what should we be do, doing about it? How can we actually uh, think it through? Um, coming back to the question that you raised, you know, in the traditional and nuclear uh, areas, um, whether we actually know how to deter and not know much about the cyber side, it's not actually true. Even in the nuclear agenda, we are not sure what, you know, when and how nuclear deterrence works. We know that in some instances, nuclear deterrence works, but we do not know whether it works in all instances that we think it works. We do not know whether an adversary actually deters to take an action just because we are we have the capability and capacity to deter them or just be or perhaps because that adversary does not think that that action would suit them and and would be valuable for them deterrence is just like very unknown in in that sense and there are uncertainties that surrounds uh, deterrence nuclear deterrence and that uncertainty surrounding the efficacy of the nuclear deterrence makes some experts question the value of deterrence itself altogether. They say that it doesn't matter, it doesn't work. And some experts actually hold on to that concept and specifically because they claim that the, the, the world is full of uncertainty and nuclear deterrence actually prevents wars. Now, regardless of where you sit and where you position yourself within that debate, there are a number of challenges that nuclear deterrence faces today that, that we need to be actually thinking of. Uh, we need to think about this because, it, because strategically and cleverly in a way that it will help us shape our decision making and our policies around, around different issue areas that we face today. Now, what do we know about the, the practice of nuclear deterrence? Nuclear, deter, nuclear weapons intend to deter an adversary not to attack with their nuclear weapons. The practice of nuclear deterrence rests on that credibility and it should be able to show the consequences of a nuclear weapons use. For an actor to be credible, they should uh, have the ability to communicate the resolve and signal the intent. And, and these are, I think, the core concepts of any strategic communication tools as well. It's really the ability to communicate your resolve and you, you need to signal the intent. And you need the capability and capacity to do that as well. Um, and it's important to realize that your deterrence at all actually rests on perception. Not, and not all actors have the same assumptions and beliefs about nuclear deterrence. Not all of them think rationally, for instance, which is which is the core concept that we relied on during the Cold War times. Um, I don't think any one of us would say that Kim Jong-un has the same rationality as Putin does or, or President Biden does. Uh, so we need to understand that uh, and put it into the 21st century context. And we have a long history between Russia and United States on nuclear deterrence and how nuclear deterrence works and each uh, other know about their capabilities and their limits and so on. But certainty around these are also becoming blurred. And there are a number of reasons for that, that, that uh, Rebecca and Lukash also mentioned. The first reason is, is, I think, the changing nature of warfare. The nature of conflict and warfare has started to change completely. It is no longer about winning wars in a battlefield, but it's more about preserving and sustaining the, the peacetime activities. But we need to realize that um, peacetime activities and conflict time activities started to fuse in together as well. For instance, you know, we mentioned about Russia using gray zone activities to test the, the boundaries of the Western allies and of NATO as well. 
and cyber attacks, for instance, or um, cyber attacks to critical infrastructure, information operations, disinformation campaigns, all actually fit into that gray zone activities that, that Russia, Russia has been putting together. Now, nuclear weapons does not deter any adversary from these type of attacks or these type of threats. It is not aimed to do so at the first place as well, right? Um, so we need to think about new types of like deterrence and whether that that new types of deterrence actually deter the way that we we we, we would aim to and want to, um, and and I think that's the, that's today the missing part. The allies do have strategies to deter disinformation campaigns or deter information operations. However, we do not know whether the impact of these strategies to prevent Russia or China following such attacks or North Korea at the first place. The impact of it is not yet known. Um, and, and we need to realize that below the threshold activities are actually escalatory. They seem to be not escalatory. They seem to be a single events. They seem to be sporadic. They are not. If you put them all together in a cumulative form, it is no, it is no longer a sporadic attack. It actually has larger impact to national security. Um, and that's why we need to think that if cyber attacks not happening today, that that uh, has an effect to any life form is one of one type of thinking. But we need to think about consider such activities happening in a conflict time. It's not going to be uh, under the threshold anymore. Everything will be feeding in. That's why we're talking about multi-domain operations today, for instance. Um, also, I, I I want to say a few words about. Um, the tendency in a way to you know, stretch nuclear deterrence, which is something that Lukash mentioned to other domains. Um, cyber deterrence is a good example for that. There are, there are some who argue that you know, hacking back the adversary would prevent the adversary to conduct uh, follow-on attacks, and that's not true. And we know that with the WannaCry attack, we know that with the solar winds and so on. Um, the threat, you know, the hacking back option signals the intent, but if you do not actually have the, the ability to follow the action afterwards, then that intent actually does not show much. So your, your ability to deter actually uh, go, goes down the drain, I would say. Now, lastly, what, what should we be doing about these things? First of all, I think we need to change the way we think about deterrence and nuclear deterrence. We need to think about the complex set of relationships for which there are many ways, many different ways to deter a hostile act. Nuclear deterrence may fit into responding to only one set of issues and maybe may fall short in explaining others. And gray zone activities, I think, is a good, a good example for that. And the second thing I think is that we need to rely on tailored deterrence perspectives. And I really liked Lukash's point about dynamic deterrence. <clears throat> we need to find a way of applying that, I think. Um, and the third and the last point, which I think goes back to uh, President of Latvia's and the Foreign Minister of Lithuania's point on resilience, is emerging technologies and new ways of warfare challenge nuclear deterrence. We need to also start thinking about deterrence through resilience. And the best way of deterrence strategy, I believe, is resilience we need to find a way to decrease the attractiveness of an attack to the adversary. And that is where the resilience comes from. Um, by creating resilient systems, this could be resilient systems of nuclear weapons architecture, it could be resilient systems um, that we put like early warning systems and so on, but also developing resilient societies, resilient to the shocks to their lady lives and also shocks to possible low likelihood but high impact events. In disinformation campaigns, for instance, this is key. If there's one thing I think that like COVID-19 pandemic should have thought us all, is that resilience is key to mitigate the risk and bouncing back even stronger. So that's, uh, I think, my take on this, Una. Thank you, dear Beza. And before I give the colleagues the chance to respond uh, to the points that you made, and thank you for making them, we just, uh, one thing in particular that you said rang really kind of touched the spot with our audiences, and that is what you spoke of when you spoke about perceptions. And so the question is, quickly, will we ever understand the perceptions of adversaries with enough confidence to, def uh, to develop effective strategy? In the realm of philosophy, maybe, but still. 
So, so it, it, this is a really important question. I think uh, there will be no hundred percent of understanding the adversary. We can we can try to understand them in terms of the cultures and norms, but there will be always a subjective point of view when we look at Russia, when we look at China. Um, the, the environment itself shapes your shapes your perception in that regard. But what could be helpful, in my view is how can we actually shape our perceptions is through the behaviors and through actions. You know, part of that perception and the way that we think about the adversaries is, is through their behaviors and through their actions. So how can we actually change that? How can we create a, an area where we could think about better suited actions for both actors to live together in a way, in a more peaceful manner. And uh, that's, that's the place where we need to think about the UN um, group of governmental experts discussion on cyber or any type of norms and behaviors that needs to be established, for instance, on the emerging tech areas. So uh, that's how I would see the perceptions, right? There's no single way of or solution of knowing the adversary. Uh, but you, we need to think about it through their actions and through their behaviors and through our actions and through our behaviors as well. It's, it's a, it's a two-way street. This actually gives hope to the regionalists out there, including myself, who make uh, a living out of analyzing um, uh, other countries and other uh, as a China analyst myself, uh, I can definitely agree with your analysis. Now, please, uh, Rebecca, do you have a response to any of the any of the points that Bezan made there? Yes, thank you. And I thought it was a wonderful presentation. Um, a couple of points that I, that I uh, wanted to make. One, and I, I agree that we do need to think about deterrence as it applies today, because we do have different global. Uh, it is a, it's a different global threat landscape than we had at the at the height of the Cold War. Um, but 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 what does that mean? It means that. The United States and our NATO allies, European um, allies, Asian allies have to think about what e the different countries, the different regimes that we are trying to deter, um, they, they come to the table with different ideas about what their national objectives are, what risk they're willing to assume, um, uh, and, and what they might deem reasonable or not reasonable. So I appreciated the point about North Korea. I actually think that the North Korean regime is incredibly rational. It's just that the North Korean regime's underlying assumptions about what its national objectives are, are wrong. Um, in other words, um, to, to the, in the mind of the North Koreans, uh, it, it makes perfect sense how they act. They believe that their, that their uh, leader is essentially a, a god. Um, they have an authoritarian closed regime. And so the challenge for the West is to not place our own understandings of what is reasonable on our adversaries as we try to consider what they may or may not do in response to our particular actions, which gets to, the, to your point about, can we really understand the intent and the actions of our adversaries? That is the hardest piece. The easier piece is understanding what capabilities they have. And even that's hard, especially in the, in the context of China, which is a very opaque country, not transparent, does not engage in arms control conversations for transparency, which, which forces the United States to make worst case scenario assumptions about what the Chinese Communist Party has because they will not be transparent. And then we have to, um, build our own force posture and defense posture towards them with a, a, a lack of information that we, we might have more of in the case of the Russian Federation. And so, so it's important that deterrence, and I, we, we've touched on this in multiple points, but I just want to make it really clear, deterrence, for effective deterrence, for, for deterrence to be effective, we have to get at what is actually going to deter our adversaries. So we might think in the West that a particular, that a conventional response is perfectly reasonable um, based on a, let's say the Russians launch, you know, a, a low yield tactical nuclear weapons, heaven forbid, against a European, sovereign European country. It may be the case that a conventional weapon in response may actually take out a particular um, uh, means of their ability to carry out another strike, but but a conventional response and to, to signal that we would only respond conventionally in the case of a nuclear 
um, offensive strike would crack deterrence. We need to we need to try to understand what will actually deter the Russians. And that is how the United States and the West um, should be thinking about deterrence. And this is why this is a hard, it's a paradox. I under, it's a paradox which makes it very challenging. And different countries are, are, are more comfortable or less comfortable with the, with the concept of a nuclear retaliatory response. Um, but, but the point of it is, is we're trying to prevent it from happening. And so we have to convince our adversary of what they are fearing of what they don't want to happen, which is why the United States and our allies should be thinking about and adapting our forces based on real threats that are changing and dynamic happening um, in real time in the 21st century. Well, thank you very much for giving me a segue into uh, bringing Wukash back into the conversation. And he had asked us to provide him with a Stratcom question. And indeed, our audience is helping us uh, kind of narrow this down. And as uh, Rebecca just said, what can we really do? So Wukash, uh, as you respond also to some of Beza's comments, maybe you can say, what, and this is a question from our colleagues uh, um, uh, who work in Stratcom, um, what are the roles and the responsibilities of NATO Stratcom in deterrence? We are not responsible for it, but we do support it. Uh, I think everybody is responsible for uh, the, the deterrence message, but it's, it's, an interesting, it's an interesting remark to start from uh, because uh, it touches uh, upon uh, a certain understanding of Stratcom that I think can be a problem rather than an asset. But let me go uh, bit by bit until I, 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 I reach that direction. Uh, so in a sense, though, strategic communications, not as Stratcom, but strategic communications are at the essence of the of deterrence because you need to be able to convey the message uh, and shape the perceptions and actions uh, of the opponent. Of course, you don't only do it through verbal or any other uh, means. Uh, you use a, a variety of, of, of means and, you know, uh, readiness level change and troop deployments uh, tend to speak uh, louder uh, than press statements. Uh, but there is, a, there is a role also for strategic communications. And I would distinguish between two aspects. One aspect is support for what we call the general deterrence. Uh, so applying it to Russia, uh, we deter Russia from uh, launching an armed attack against a NATO country. A and there is a kind of continuous role of Stratcom uh, in that uh, task in a number of uh, areas. Uh, one, by uh, transmitting uh, to the opponent uh, our set of deterrence messages deterrence messages based around the idea of uh, political unity, cohesion, uh, capability, uh, willingness, as it is, uh, for example, put um, in our statements, but also in our doctrine. Then uh, pushing out messages about deterrence related actions, exercises were mentioned, but also um, deployments, uh, also uh, any kind of uh, contacts with, with the partners. Um, so that's one part. Uh, then the second part uh, is informing uh, our audience, uh, but also uh, the, the audience outside um, about the nature of the deterrence posture that NATO has uh, without sugarcoating it. Uh, so I'm always a little bit worried when I see uh, the news flashes from the uh, uh, extended forward presence or tailored forward presence forces, which is about you know, how we love the local cuisine and how we are friendly with the people. Uh, it's all nice, but you know, it's, it's not exactly deterrence. There is a, a root cause of the deterrence as word, which is about terror, which is about creating fear. So there must be an element also to, uh, of, of showing uh, to everybody that the deterrence posture uh, is also about the ability to fight and to prevail in a, in a conflict. Uh, and the third issue is about assuring our populations more generally. Uh, but that's general deterrence. Then you have immediate deterrence. Uh, so uh, in September, we uh, are deterring uh, Russians from launching an attack under the cover of Zapad exercises. And I'm not saying this is going to happen, but just to give you an example of uh, immediate deterrence uh, situation. Uh, and at that point, 
Um, I'm slightly worried that in a, a information space, uh, which is uh, con congested, uh, contested, uh, flooded with this information, uh, Stratcom uh, would basically lose the ability to convey the Terence messages, uh, that it would be seen just as a, an information noise or something which is done uh, by the specialized Stratcom cells within a particular organization. Uh, and I'm a little bit afraid that this might be actually ignored uh, by the opponent. Um, and it also has the, it also acts, uh, acts in the other way. Uh, so there'll be a lot of noise coming out of the, from, from the opponent. And it would be, it might be difficult uh, to distinguish and catch uh, the actual deterrence uh, messages, especially that there will be a lot of freelancers around. Uh, there'll be diplomats doing all sorts of uh, outrageous comments. There will be TV commentators uh, threatening destruction of, of our cities. Uh, so uh, for me, it is an open question to what extent actually the, the Stratcom means can uh, operate uh, in this area of the acute, uh, in this phase of the acute presence, the acute crisis. Um, and at that point, I think some of the more, more traditional uh, more old fashioned means of diplomatic, uh, political, military to military channels of communication, uh, they might kind of come back to being the decisive uh, conveyors of the Terence messages. And we will indeed return to this uh, Stratcom angle of our conversation. But at the same time, I would like to uh, bring it back to Beza and just to follow back on what Rebecca said and what our, our, our viewers have also noticed, um, are we sometimes mistaken in our ability to, de de to deter? Um, sometimes we perceive ourselves as being able to deter, but it's actually not the case. So, yes, so um, there are areas where, where probably we, we thought in, in Western society that deterrence worked. And in reality, actually, maybe it, it might have been something else that, that actually prevented either a conflict or an action and so on. Now, we would never know, we, we would never know whether it was the deterrence or something else that actually prevented that because deterrence is something that's, that's, that you can't see, right? That's, that's the whole thing, that's the whole logic of it. And you fear from the action, you fear that the other side actually might attack or you, might, you fear the consequences of an action. And that's, that's fundamental in the nuclear, at least in the nuclear deterrence thinking because the consequences are all of an attack is so high that you, you prefer not to take an action and you need to keep the status quo as it is. So it is something that is actually invisible. And, and the fear of the action itself and the, the fear of the consequences itself is taking us to, to, to not to attack. Um, but I would say that there are, there are cases probably, I mean, take it out from the nuclear realm and take, put it back to the, the cyber realm or the emerging uh, tech realm. Um, we know that the deterrence itself or the cyber deterrence itself did not work in, in, in certain uh, areas. Um, hackback, we know, as I mentioned, that did not work. But also, um, I, I do not think that the logic of, for instance, cyber deterrence has been established yet. Um, I'm not, I, I don't think that, 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 that is true. I don't think that, um, you know, Russia or China would not attack uh, nuclear weapon systems or any type of weapon systems. Um, because there's no agreement on that. And just because we do not see something happening doesn't mean that it's not happening uh, or doesn't mean that it did not take place. Um, we do not have any known incidents, for instance, uh, from, from you know, previous, there, there is no known incidents of a nuclear weapons uh, system hack. But we know actually that there are a lot of incidents from the supply chain onwards that the, the attackers actually tried to infiltrate uh, into weapon systems, including nuclear weapon systems. Um, there is in the North Korea case, for instance, there has been a lot of uh, reports, public reports on this, that the United States tried to infiltrate into the North Korean nuclear weapon systems. And there was actually one incident in 2016, I believe, that one of the ballistic missile uh, launch 
had failed. And then it all started whether actually it was the United States who, who followed that uh, attack. So we need to be, I think, careful a little bit about the way that we think about cyber deterrence and the way that we say uh, that there has not been much you know, attack happened to the weapon systems. There's just things that we do not know doesn't mean that they, they're not taking place. Um, and, and also there are a lot, a lot of attacks on the critical national infrastructure. Um, Iran is only like one of the examples for that. The NHS attack, the, the, the WannaCry attack is a really good example of how devastating things can take. Uh, another good example of that, and I can give millions of examples on the cyber actually, another good example is the city of Atlanta attack and the impact, the economic impact that it costs. Um, I can think about, for instance, attack to space assets, cyber attack to space assets. And, and if a successful attack as such can takes place, then, the, then there will be cascading impact to the critical national infrastructure to the weapon systems and so on. So we are talking about systems that are actually linked with each other. It's not a system that is, you know, that's, that's siloed on its own. That's why, you know, in a crisis time, in a conflict time, I believe that we will see uh, higher consequences uh, than what we are seeing uh, today. I think Rebecca, you want to uh, get it, get in. Just, just quickly though, Beza, <laughs> don't leave that fast. Uh, right. I got you right here. Uh, what? You were saying that you know that this is kind of a tough, uh, tough uh, situation, and um, but you mentioned that you know once such an attack takes place, it uh, affects all these linked systems and it ripples down, and but our audience members are wondering, well, if there's the linked effects, could there maybe be a link to the response? Can we credibly deter aggressive behavior in other domain than the attack is expected? Um, for example. Attack, attack in information sphere and the response in diplomatic or economic one, how we should signal out intentions to the adversary for him to, or her, to understand our aims and avoid any further escalation. If you could just quickly come back on that. Yes, so th th this is a really good question because we generally think about deterrence as like one-to-one -one as if it's like the same nuclear deterrence det uh, deters nuclear weapons attacks, that's true, but deterrence itself is, n is not the same concept in the conventional space as, as well as in the new emerging uh, space as well. And I think the asymmetrical, asymmetrical response is probably the best way forward in a way when you think about the emerging technology areas. So you do not try to deter cyber attacks with a cyber attack. You can deter cyber attacks with other type of measures that you may want to put through asymmetrically in a way. Um, one thing though we need to be careful about is the escalation process of that. When you're thinking to deter a cyber attack through another measure, you may unintentionally escalate the situation. So, so we gotta be very careful really on, on clearing the lines where, where you are escalating and where, when, where you are actually uh, just responding at the same level. Uh, so that that should be uh, that should be obvious, I think, um, and it's not at all times obvious. It's not all times uh, clear and certain. Rebecca, please, to for, the floor is yours again. Sure. Yes, I, I would just say that I think that nuclear deterrence has held um, over the last many decades. The last time uh, a nuclear weapon was employed intentionally in a time of war, of course, was the United States um, uh, ending the, the Second World War. And we have not seen uh, the, the intentional employment of, a, of a, an atomic weapon since then, nor have we seen a major war uh, of the likes that we saw in the two major world wars. That is not to say um, that we still haven't seen military conflict. Of course, we have, uh, even at the beginning of the Cold War, we, the, the Korean War, of course, was an incredibly bloody uh, war with a high number of, of, of casualties. But we, did, but we haven't seen anything like to the, to the, on the scale of the two world wars. And so um, I, I'm, I'm very persuaded that nuclear deterrence has held for its purpose, which is not strictly to uh, prevent the employment of nuclear weapons, but it is to, it is to deter major war. It is to deter major war. And the reason I want to make that distinction is because 
we have not adopted a no first use policy, meaning the doctrine of no first use is to say that a nuclear weapon would only be would only be employed. Um, we would not be the ones to employ one first. And a sole purpose used would be to only employ a nuclear weapon in response to a nuclear weapon. We, we maintain a policy of strategic ambiguity because the purpose of nuclear weapons is again to deter major war. And so there can be purely conventional strategic attack against a NATO ally for the purpose of destroying the NATO alliance that may actually in fact have strategic consequences. And, and that the, that, um, the alliance uh, may may determine um, a, a nuclear retaliatory response is is an, is an appropriate response. So I, I want to make that clear distinction. And 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 again, this goes back to uh, the great points about signaling resolve. A lot of deterrent because a deterrence is an art. It is an art. It is not a very clean mechanistic formula. It's not a science. And so a lot of geopolitics plays into what is going on in the minds of our adversaries. And then. Um, and, and I would just, I want to say too, for, um, we, we've talked a lot about punitive deterrence, you know, retaliatory responses, but I, I, I really want to highlight the importance of, deter, of deterrence by defense or deterrence through denial. Um, this is why American and allied um, missile defenses are so critically important. Our cooperation with, with Poland um, and Romania um, is so important because uh, missile defenses um, plays a role in our overall strategic architecture to to limit damage and have an, an, an option to, to have retaliatory responses in various scenarios. And, and then the last thing I would just say is nuclear deterrence isn't really a separate thing from everything else we do conventionally. We, we, we assume that nuclear deterrence will hold in all these various other conventional war planning that, that, that countries carry out. Um, in other words, you know, whenever you're thinking about a, a particular crisis or conflict that you're trying to deter or dissuade or, or de-escalate, kind of baked into that assumption in those operations is that it's not going to spill over into a major war. So, you know, all major wars started off as small war, wars. And so I think it's important that we think about that, um, which is why it's so important that we're thinking seriously about deterrence, about nuclear deterrence, about how we're signaling resolve and making sure that our countries, in fact, do have resolve. Back to Lukash's point, I thought this was brilliant. It does make me uncomfortable when I hear allies downplaying threats that exist, because I think it's I think it is important to be clear. That's part of our signaling and strategic communications about what we would deem unacceptable behavior and what we clearly see are threats. I mean, the Russians have been militarizing the Black Sea for a long time, and and it and only some allies have been comfortable talking about that publicly, and so. That would be one particular example uh, of an area where I would encourage allies, you know, to for, to help us get on the same page better, to better recognize the threats. And the Western Europeans, of course, the Germans, I think, of in particular, have different ideas about what the threats are, which then affects how they think about what are appropriate uh, deterrent actions and activities to take, both by signaling and with hard power um, movements. Um, and, and so that's why I think in, uh, that the, 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 I, I wasn't going to bring it up, but I'm going to bring it up. That's why I think Nord Stream 2 is so incredibly awful, um, because I think it is terrible for communicating resolve in understanding who the primary threat to NATO is. It's the Russian Federation. And so the alliance should be doing things to, to not just take care of their own particular interests, but also take into account what other allies within the alliance are saying. Um, based on even just a, something like that seems like a non-military uh, idea, Nord Stream 2 and how that plays into um, the credibility of deterrence. Thank you, Rebecca. Now, Wukash, uh, do you have a comeback on that? And once you, you have a short comeback on that, I have a very interesting question for you. So stay tuned. Sure, just, just, <laughs> just, just for the record, the Polish participant wasn't the first one to mention Nord Stream 2. It was the American participant, uh, but of course I, I shared Rebecca's uh, views that uh, the, the policy has to be coherent. Um, and of course it doesn't mean that it has to be overall aggressive uh, and deterrence uh, posture actually uh, can coexist uh, with arms control 
can coexist and actually requires maintaining some kind of dialogue, dialogue and engagement with the opponent because it, it is a relationship in which you are trying to uh, impact uh, the, the perceptions of, of the opponent. And of course, the opponent is trying to impact uh, your perceptions. Uh, just, just very quickly, two issues. One about the, the, the cyber uh, aspect and what Beza said. Uh, and I think we need to distinguish that uh, deterrence uh, is about preventing certain things from happening um, and assumes that we are operating uh, in a peacetime or in a crisis. Uh, you enter into wartime and several things become possible. Uh, including attacks that cyber attacks uh, that are prepared during the peacetime or the crisis time. And that's why you need infiltration. That's why you need intelligence uh, gathering um, things like this. So personally, I don't believe that you know, everything would be off limits uh, during uh, a, a wartime. Of course, uh, the, war, the, the laws of war apply. Uh, so, you know, act, Cyber attack against a, a hospital would still be a war crime, uh, but you know otherwise there would be no sanctuaries when it comes to uh, cyber attacks, unless some form of intra-war deterrence uh, and escalation management uh, is established. But then we are talking kind of we are opening a completely different box uh, in our discussion uh, about deterrence. So that's one thing. The second thing, very quickly, the idea of the uh, cross-domain deterrence. BESA gave you the kind of positive uh, view on that. Uh, the, the certain problem is that not all domains are created equal. Uh, and especially the move uh, from uh, non-kinetic to kinetic uh, or from uh, non-casualty to casualty uh, aspect uh, is a very difficult to, to one to, to make and would be a very difficult one to make. So for example, uh, do you uh, conduct a precision strike that kills 20 of enemy soldiers if you were attacked in the cyberspace? So far, I haven't seen it happening. Thank you, dear Lukas. And uh, just to Quickly, if I can ask you, just we have a very good question here, but I'm putting myself in danger by putting it out there because our panel is almost over. So quickly, is NATO political level able to balance the, multi, uh, the military posturing for deterrence performed by NATO military? Where does the political level come in? Do you want me to answer? Of course, it is. Of course, it is able to do that. We have been practicing deterrence uh, since NATO's beginning, uh, and there is nothing which is an inherently impossible to do about the current uh, deterrence uh, posture and the, the current uh, threats. Uh, but you know, that requires, and here I go back to, to Rebecca, that requires a very open discussion of what your deterrence approach can bring you and what are the limits of deterrence? Because deterrence is not a universal solution to everything. There are other approaches, there are other policies that the Alliance uh, should, uh, should make. And I can just go back to the Harmel report, which was part deterrence, but was part dialogue and engagement and shaping the international uh, environment. And I see it perfectly, that NATO being perfectly able to do a similar thing. Uh, and that's enough for me. Thank you, dear colleagues. And now a quick lightning round to sum up and to finish. Back to the question of our, of our um, panel today, um, old thinking versus new challenges. So the question is, it's a yes, no, and why question, right? So whether you agree or not, and quickly why, should NATO uh, deterrence concept adapt and widen in the coming, in this decade? Beza, please, yes, no, why? Oh, starting with me, uh, deterrence concept, you didn't say nuclear, shouldn't it, yes, it should be widened, um, but it should be widened to a level that we need to understand what we are uh, deterring and who we are deterring and when we are deterring them and in which uh, type of uh, conditions are we deterring them. As Lucas said, it's a dynamic concept, so you can't just, just put one concept out and make it as, a, as an overarching concept to, to apply to every threat that NATO faces. So that's my answer.
Rebecca, you have 30 seconds. Yes, no, and why? Yes, of course. And I think it's, you know, the United States is no longer sitting at the apex of its power that we enjoyed at the height of the Cold War. We have many, many challenges. The United States must have strong, robust, sovereign allies and partners and alliances. And because we now face not just the Russian Federation, but the Chinese Communist Party, we really need all hands on deck to be thinking very, very seriously about maintaining credible deterrence to preserve the peace that we've enjoyed um, and to deter major power conflict. Thank you. Lukash, what's your take on the problem? I think it's clear for the whole discussion that yes is the is the answer. Uh, the the basics of the Terence posture are uh, the Terence approach are the same, uh, but the operationalization, uh, of course, changes and will change over time. So, as I said, we can't be static. This is not a static concept. Uh, so you know either we adopt uh, or we will see the Terence failures. Excellent panel. I personally learned a lot both from Beza, uh, Lukas, and Rebecca, as well as from our audience. It has been an honor and a pleasure to be your moderator today and see you in other formats.